got 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock in us? All right, I do anyway. Go ahead. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. It is a privilege to be back with you again. We love Brother and Sister Julian so much. Uh, their kind heart and sweet spirits endear you to them the first time you meet them. Uh, I love being with God's people. I love studying the word of the Lord. I did go to the most liberal school in the Midwest for sure, striving to be called the most liberal school in the nation. Uh, they're working hard at it. Uh, but I, I was there multiple times in class. Lord, why? And the Lord knows what he's doing. I, I tell you what, when you realize that the world is looking for something else and you have it, um, I'm going to tell you, there's a whole lot of people out there trying to have church, but the ground that they're building on is not very solid, and they can't explain the explosive, powerful growth of, of, of Pentecostalism for sure and the fastest segment of Pentecostalism, which is oneness Pentecostals, and they kind of look at us and go, what's going on? You guys teach all that stuff. You actually believe the Bible. Imagine that. you know. And so I, I had a whole lot of fun, and... Uh, I hope to tonight I'm going to try to do something a little different. I gave them a PowerPoint. I'm not sure it's going to. Oh, he gave me a thumbs up. Man of God, you're going to heaven just for trying to keep up with me tonight. I do have notes up here. So if you'll just kind of keep going, I'll, I'll do my best to kind of uh, track along with you. What I'd like to do tonight is uh, there's a few things I'd like to do. I, I've taught on the Godhead, I believe, the last time I was here. Uh, what I'd like to talk about tonight is try to reframe our understanding of what it means to uh, be baptized with the Spirit. All right? so how many of you are filled with the Holy Ghost? Amen, amen. Well, I want to talk about a little bit tonight a way that will help us sharpen and maybe speak to those outside of our movement and uh, challenge them to come on in and experience what we have tonight. So I'd like to talk about, if you'll uh, start the PowerPoint. Is that a one minute or you're good to go? Okay, good. I want to talk about new life in the Spirit. Or to say it another way, living in the both now and the not yet. All right? How many of you know we've received the earnest of our inheritance? But we haven't, we haven't received everything yet. And so eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men, the things that God has prepared for them that love Him as it, at His appearing. So what I want to talk about tonight is what is the Holy Ghost and help us to understand that it's, it's more than a goosebump machine. And if, if the Lord can help me tonight, uh, I, want to, I want to talk about summing up Christianity in two words. Turn to your neighbor and say, those words are, New life. All right, you can sum up Christianity literally in those two words. That's why the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Literally, it's the new creation. And it's going to make sense when we get there and by the help of the Lord. So I want to talk about the Holy Ghost as the means by which we enter the kingdom of God. You say, well, Brother Kilman, we know that. Well, I understand that's true. My Lord, I'm already on the next slide. Forgive me. Should I, should I give you a thumbs up? or Okay, all right, I, I am already on the next slide, so we'll just kind of go there. If, he go, if he's got enough patience, we're going to be good. If not, I'm going to have to buy him dinner after church. All right, so what I want to talk about, the Holy Ghost came as not just a goosebump machine, but as a reversal of the fall. All right, this is what the Bible says. Christ was manifest in the flesh to destroy the works of the devil. All right, so that means I'm glad I get to go to heaven. But I'm glad that God gave me more than just the ride through here. He said, I'm, I'm going to give you the get out of hell free card, and I'm going to take you into eternity. But there's some things I want to do in your life right now. I can make you a better man right now. I can make you a better woman right now, God says. I can give you a better marriage right now. Okay, I'm going to tell you, you don't have to look very far out into the world, but you see people with broken marriages and broken homes, and you know what they need? They need somebody to come in and tell them there's a possibility of new life. All right? So what does that mean? Well, let's, let's lay a little groundwork. In the Old Testament, you can see this anticipation of some things that come down the road, but yet we don't see the fulfillment yet. 
All right, so the first thing that they hoped for was mirrored in Joel 2, uh, 28 and 29, which Peter quotes on the day of Pentecost. It's the hope that one day everybody would be filled with the Spirit. In the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will uh, dream dreams. Your young men. All that anticipation was something that they looked forward to but never saw. Now, here's what happens. When, when the Bible says uh, uh, that that new hope was coming, uh, this is what happens. On the day of Pentecost, it happens, and, and God baptizes us with his spirit. He starts the new thing. But what begins to happen? Again, humanity begins to put their hands on the work of God. And what, what occurs is the result of institutionalism. You get man-made attempts to be spiritual. Now, pardon me tonight, but you get religious systems that's devoid and disconnected from that powerful new birth in Acts chapter 2, and it's man's attempt to change the world. Now, God said, I've got more than yet. So what happens with institutionalism is the death of what God's agenda was in the world and the dream and the vision that was brought by the Spirit of God. All right, so the second thing uh, that they anticipated but didn't receive was the Spirit-anointed ministry of the ideal king because they knew the world was broken. So they anticipate a Messiah. I'm so sorry. I, you're trying back there very hard. Let me know when you're ready for me to give you thumbs up. And I'm good to go. Okay. All right. So the spirit anointed ministry of an ideal king. This is what happens. They said, we know that the world is broken. We know that Adam and Eve failed. And ultimately what happens is, is we're anticipating the Messiah, the anointed one. Now, what does anointing mean? Well, all anointing is, is in being empowered to do a task. So what they were looking at, just like in the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God would move on men to prophesy or anoint judges or leaders in Israel, guess what would happen? God would empower them to lead. And what they anticipated was, was more than just a regular king. They were looking for the king of kings. All right, They were looking for somebody who would come along eventually and fix it. And see, that's what God came to do. John 1 says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Then it goes on to explain existence about how the fall happened and how humanity was broken. Proverbs says it like this, the wicked stumble in deep darkness and know not what they stumble at. They're trying to have good marriages. They're trying to have good lives, right? That's the condition of the world. They're trying to do things right, but guess what? There's an enemy that's after them, that's wrecking their lives. They're stumbling around in darkness, and then guess what has to happen? The light has to come. And that's why the Bible says Jesus came, and in him was life. And life was the light of men. You know what the light of the world is? It's the new life that we have in the Spirit. Okay, that means when you walk on your job and all people know is pain and heartache and broken relationships and addiction, when you walk in on your job, you represent something else. You come in saying, you can have a better life. You come in and Jesus said, you're the light of the world. How are you the light of the world? Not because maybe, you know, I've seen how you cut your grass. Right? I'm astounded at the lines that you know. It's the new life. It's the way you act. It's the way you live. It's being separated by the power of the Spirit from sin and showing them a new way to live. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to show a new way to be in the world. So tonight, if we turn down all the lights and we spray paint the doors, right, and we turn off all the lights, we'd be in total darkness, right? And we could eke out an existence. We could kind of go around. I could say, oh, there's a guy. His voice sounds familiar. Yeah, that's my son, Joel. I could walk up to him and say, there's somebody else. That's, and then you could tell by feel and touch and say, that's Brother Kilman because he has less hair than other people. All right, so we could eke out an existence, right? But what if somebody could come on and flip the light switch? And see, that's what the Bible says happens when God came into the world. In him was life. Paradise regained. In him was the new life, the new possibility of living outside of this broken world. 
You see, that's what God has designed the church to be. Light in the world. You're a new life, a possibility of coming out of darkness into this marvelous light. And what is that light? It's the new life made available in Christ. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 and 4, But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. See, that's that's the contrast. There's light, but then there's darkness. And so what we see when Jesus comes onto the earth, earth is he come to destroy the works of the devil, to reverse the fall. Right, So what we see in his ministry here as a man is the earmarks or the signs of the old age, the old broken fallen realm dying. How do you see that? Well, because he's healing diseases. He's casting out demons. They're subject to him. He even quells the chaos that's in nature. Now, what was Jesus saying? Pay attention to my ministry because the reversal of the fall is happening right now. All right, so that's why Nicodemus comes to him and he says, we know you're a, a teacher sent from God because no man can do what you do unless he's sent by God. There's something working in you that we see. There's something powerful in you that we know that this has to be something occurring. It's the reversal of the fall. Uh, that, that's what he said. Look at Luke 7, 19 through 23. I'm going to try to behave tonight. All right, and it says this, And John called unto him two of his disciples and sent them unto Jesus said, Art thou he that should come or should we look for another? When the men were coming to him, he said, You tell John uh, what you have seen. Uh, They said, Rather, uh, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or should we look for another? And and look at what the text says in Luke 7, 19 uh, through 23. And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Now here they come to try to talk to Jesus about how to comfort John, and, and he says, hold on one minute, and he turns around and starts doing all sorts of miracles. Now why does Jesus do that? Then Jesus said unto them, go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. And blessed is he, he says, who's not offended in me. Now, why was he doing that? He's showing John the signs. He says, I know, John, that you're worried because you knew that I was coming to overthrow and you're thinking I'm going to overthrow Rome and I am going to come back and I'm going to judge the world and I'm going to set up the kingdom and I'm going to rule with a rod of iron, but that's not yet. But what you can see is the earmarks in my ministry now that I've come to destroy the works of the devil. You go back and show John that everything hasn't happened yet, but you can see enough to know I am who I claim to be. He came. Even even the quintessential enemy of death. Let's look at it. John 11, 33. The Bible says, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was uh, troubled. Now, the Greek word there for groaned in the spirit is embria asato. And it literally means he grew angry in spirit. Now, why does Jesus grow angry in spirit? Because he's at the tomb of a loved one looking death right in the eye and saying, this is not how it should be. This was never my intention, and this was never my plan, and I've come to destroy the... You listen to this preacher. You got the Holy Ghost, but that's just the earnest of your inheritance. God's going to usher us into eternity, and there will be no more sickness, no more death. Every enemy will be destroyed. When he came down here walking around on earth, he said, this is not, I've come to reverse some stuff. I've come to break some stuff. And when you walk out into these neighborhoods and marriages are troubled and people's lives are wrecked, you need to get angry in spirit, not at people, but at the sin and the destruction of the enemy working in their life. Take some authority and tell them there's some other things that you can do. You can come out and God can heal some things. He can put marriages together. He can break addiction. He can bring a release from the fall and the things that the enemy's brought in your life. It's like a story of the man. He's driving down the road and his car breaks down. And he does what we men do. Well, you know, he goes out and he pops a hood up. We don't know what we're doing, but we're going to look in there. I got a brother... And a, a, a dad who's both mechanics, so I'm severely handicapped. 
I handed him wrench, wrenches. That's all I did. Socket, 916. Yeah, I think I can find that one. And I tried, And that's all I had to do my whole life, so I don't know anything. I, I know, I, well, there's a battery. That's where the air filter goes. That's it. That's all I got. And so here this man, he's looking under the hood, trying to figure out what's going on. And he said, this nice limousine pulls in behind him. Guy gets out and comes around, and he's got, you know, tuxedo on. He said, I see you're having car trouble. <laughs> having car trouble. Uh, the hood's up. He's thinking to himself, now what can this guy do? He said, you care if I take a look? And the guy says, you know, kind of rolls his eyes. Okay, sure, you know, guy in the suit, he's going to look up the hood, under the hood. He said, sure, go ahead and take a look. So he takes his jacket off, rolls up his shirt, shirt sleeves, and tinkers with it a little bit. And then he says, uh, go, hop in and try it now. The man gets in, he turns on, it fires right up. He come, gets out, and he shuts the hood. He said, I can't believe that you fixed it. He said, how in the world could you fix it? He said, well, you have to understand something. I'm Henry Ford. And I made this car, and I can't stand to see one of my creation broken down on the side of the road. Now listen, you need to get a picture of the heart of God. When He gave you the Holy Ghost, He gave it to you to reverse the work of the enemy in your life, to bring you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but to kill, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have a life and have it more abundantly. What is he saying? I've, call, I've come. I gave you the Holy Ghost to bring about the fall of the broken age. i come to destroy what sin has done in the world. And in my ministry, that's what I've come to do. Why? Because he's not going to let hell have the last say. You listen to this preacher. He won't tolerate it forever. And I know there are saints in here. Maybe you're under pressure. Maybe you're fighting the attacks of the enemy on your home. I'm going to tell you, he's not going to let hell have the last say. One day, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you just need to understand that maybe it's not happening altogether right yet. But if I just hold out, I know he's going to take me through. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the inbreaking kingdom of God on the earth. Jesus in the person of Christ established a beachhead from which to launch the attack. And in that attack, what is he trying to destroy? Well, the fall. You see, the fall broke the world and brought in this old age. And Jesus says, I've come to bring in new life. And that new life means being conformed to the image of Christ. You can be conformed to the image of Christ. Aren't you glad that you don't, God didn't leave you broken on the side of the road? But He said, I can fix you. If you're interested, I can make you, I can make you into such a man that your wife will appreciate you. Right? Hallelujah. The day I get it best is when I'm on the cross and I've died out to my flesh and I'm walking in the Spirit and I'm yielded to God. That's when my family appreciates me the best. That's when I walk the best as a man. I'm going to tell you there's new life in the Spirit. All right, so what are you talking about, Brother Kim? Look at Colossians 1, 26 and 27. He said, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to who? His saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is this glorious mystery, Paul? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. What hope of glory? The glory of an enchristment. The glory of Christ in you. The ability to be better than you could ever be on your own. Paul said that who can deliver me from the body of this death? The things I don't want to do, that's the things I do. The things I don't, I, I want to do, I don't do. Who can deliver me? He said, but thanks be to God who through Christ has given us the victory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I, I, that, I wish I had time to go a, a lot further, but I'm going to try to stay streamlined. I do have a lot. Brother Julian said, take your time. But my wife's right there. She's got a good call. Don't panic. Look at what Paul does in Romans 12, chapter 2. He says, Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now what is Paul saying in uh, Romans 12, chapter 2? Where well, the Greek word there for world is not cosmos, it's not the physical universe, it's aeon. It's the age. He's saying don't be conformed to the spirit of the age. Look, 
For Paul, it's incredulous that a person that's baptized with the Spirit could be conformed and bound by the same old world that God came to destroy. He said, look, I pulled you out and given you victory, so don't be conformed. Don't get trapped back into the beggarly elements of this world. Walk in victory. And that's what Paul is saying. That's why the Bible says we're pilgrims and strangers here. What is, it? what is a pilgrim? A stranger. It means I'm just kind of passing through. My treasures are laid up where? Somewhere else other than materialism and the lies of this age about what values are. See, I'm going to tell you, God can give you such a victory that you can look him right in the eye and say, if you take me to the stake and try to burn me, it's okay because I've caught sight of something you can't destroy and it's called eternity. And God has placed it in my heart. See, they tried to let the, they throw them to lions. Who cares? Do I care what a lion can do to me? I, I don't fear man that can destroy the body. God has given us victory by tying us to the eternal. But not only that, he's made us ambassadors of Christ. What's an ambassador? You ready? An ambassador goes to another country and sets up a little piece of land and represents something else. So God has lodged you here not to be a part of this. You're not, you're, this ain't your country. He's made you a part of the kingdom of God and given you such a life that what you know what you're doing? You're walking around and they're saying, he's saying, I, I know if you're tired of living in this country, I know a better country. And I know the king of a better country. And that's what God is doing in your life every day. So what glory is that Paul talking about? New life, which is ushering in the reign of God that will last from now to eternity. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 20. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. On my servants, on my handmaidens, I'll pour out of, uh, in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And then look at what he says. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath and blood and fire and vapor of smoke and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into the blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Now what did Peter just do to me? He took me to Acts chapter 2 and then he about gave me whiplash and dragged me to Revelation. Now why, why is it on the day of Pentecost preacher, the preacher's up talking, Peter, saying, I want to talk to you about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the book of Revelation. Okay, why is he saying that? Because he's saying right here at Pentecost, God has set in motion the train of events which will culminate in the final judgment of the world. If you're looking for anything else, baby, you ain't going to find it because this is all there is. Look, right now, what we have in Christ is going to be from here all the way to the end of the age. And this is what he's saying. I know that the old age is in the throes of dying. I know that the reason that you feel the pressure in your life and the enemy attacking you so much is he knows his time is short. And that's what it means. And here's what life in the Spirit is for the Christian. I'm gonna get, I know I'm being technical tonight, a little theoretical, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get right down to where we're living now. What is life in the Spirit? It's living in the overlap of two kingdoms. It's living in the both now and the not yet. It's the tension. We have new life. But not all the enemies are destroyed yet. All right, how many of you can still be tempted? I can be tempted. Sure. I get hungry. It's bad. I get hungry and tired. It's really bad. I'm tempted to be a grouch. Don't amen too loud, honey. So I'm living in the overlap. I know that I can still be tempting, uh, tempted. And living in the overlap of these two realms or these two kingdoms and one is fighting another, this is the life in the Spirit that the Christian lives with. All right, I'll show you what it looks like. This is the contract. I don't have time to tease it all out. You'll have to trust me. Go to uh, John yourself and look at the way it's described. The old age, that old world broken by the fall, is marked by this. John says it's like blindness. It's death. It's slavery. It's pain and brokenness and lies. All you have to do is look out and you know what? You've described marriages. You've described homes. You've described all the things that are operating in our world. But the new life that God brings says, I've come to give you sight. 
I've come to give you life and liberty, peace and righteousness and revelation. See, there's a two ways to live in this world. It's one outside of the blessing of God and those that are in the blessings of God. And their lives are marked by these wonderful new things. So what does it look like? Click the next slide for me. We have this old age that is marked by the fall. All right? And so when the world was broken in the fall, that's where we started to live. That's the old age. This is where we're living at right now. That's where everything is broken, everything is destroyed. But then God comes in. Jesus comes in to bring in the new realm or the kingdom of God. And right here, right here, that's where Jesus enters the world. And he says, this is the start of everything. That's why the Bible calls him the firstborn among many brethren. He was the starting point. He was the prototype. And now, now we can step in to that same place through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And right there. But see, this is where the old age is going to be destroyed. And the enemy's going to come in. And God's going to say, that's it. That's the end of it right there. But where we're living at right now is right here. In the overlap of the two kingdoms. And that's why you fight so much. Because the enemy knows his time is short. And he's going to be destroyed. And he's looking to take everybody he can with him. All right, and that's, that's, so let's, let's talk about it a little bit. What does that look like practically, Brother Tillman? I'm glad you asked. It means today, even in churches, there can be non-biblical thinking. Here's the danger. There can be old age thinking in very, very religious forms. There's a great commentary about, by Great House and Dunning. He says it this way. The logical conclusion of this line of thinking is that even today, we may truly encounter God in ways that result in or manifest less than normative New Testament religion. Wow. What does that look like? It looks like dead formalism. Institutionalism. You ready? Non-scriptural paradigms. I try not to be uh, too offensive. But I have this facetious side. It's like opening up an advertisement and they have praise dancer wrote. And you're like, what? Because what they do, okay, you ready? This is a non-scriptural paradigm. We're going to dress you up in, in praise dancer robes, and we're going to boogie up here for Jesus. And what Pentecostals are thinking is when the, when the Spirit of God begins to move and people start shouting under the unction of God, thinking about the victory that God had, maybe you've been fighting hell all week, and then God just gave you the victory, and you can't wait till Sunday night when somebody starts to get up on the keyboard like they did tonight and begin to play and sing, and somebody says, it's not enough to stay in the pew tonight. I'm going to get out in the aisle and give God a little praise. And Brother Julian says, now how in the world am I going to get my robe on him? You see, because it wasn't made that way, that's man's attempt at trying to do something in the Spirit. I'm going to tell you, you can't preach without the Spirit. You can't have church without the Spirit. You're only trying to do something in your flesh. But there is a power from God that will make you a witness to new life. Look at what he says. Now, this is a good statement by a good Baptist man. He said, dogmatism, therefore, is ill-advised. I thought, that's pretty good. Now, what does that mean? That means we can end up fighting the battle with the wrong tools. We ain't the smartest or the richest or, the, or anything. We got God on our side. Oh. Okay, I need a witness tonight then. I know we got some young people up here and they haven't lived for God too long, haven't faced too many battles. All right, but I need some uh, older people, some saints to be a witness to say, you know what? I faced some things when it didn't look like there could be any way, and God stepped in. See, that's what it is. I'm not going to try to live for God in the flesh. That's why Paul said to the Galatians, Oh, foolish Galatians, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? No, this is where we started. This is where we're going to stay. And that's more than just the surface uh, comment, by the way, when he says in him we live and move and have our being. It means if you ain't born again, you're not in the kingdom. You're not participating in victory. Okay, I'm going to try to behave. So if that's the case, if we're the spirit-filled church, then what is our role in the world? Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the disciples. There sends out 70 of them. 
And the, and the Bible says, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He said, Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. Don't think they're a big deal. Why? Because the old age is going to be destroyed. Don't take them too seriously. Don't worry about that so much. Rejoice because your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, now that's incredible, right? We know that. But that little statement that Jesus says, most people just skim right over, where he says, and I saw, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, I, other people can teach other things on it. This is what I feel Jesus is disclosing in this verse. When they come back and they said, when we go out and we reach out to people and touch them, Lord, in your name, things happen. And he says, I, be, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, why is he quoting that? That's that Ezekiel stuff, that Isaiah stuff. Why is he quoting those passages? Because Jesus looked at his disciples and said, I see in the touch of your ministry the reversal of the fall. And so here's what God is saying. When you walk out of this church, this is what you should do. You should reach out and touch people, and guess what will happen? Every time you teach a Bible study and someone sees it and repents of their sin, Every time they come to the church and they get baptized in Jesus' name. Every time someone is filled with the Spirit, God's looking down at His church. He's looking down at your life and saying, in your life, I see the fall of Satan. That's what He's built you to do. I know sometimes we can get intimidated, but I'm going to tell you, you can walk under the most liberal campus or college or, or university in this world, and I'm going to tell you what they're going to do. They're going to take respectful looks at Pentecostalism because they've seen the effect. I'm going to tell you, don't, don't, don't be intimidated by the enemy. You walk out of here with the power of God and an understanding that He gave me new life, that I could walk out and shake this world. Not because I'm so powerful, but because there's a heaven to win and I can take people with me if they're willing to go. So I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to witness about it. I'm going to knock doors and talk to people. Why? Because I want everybody to go with me. I, 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 I wish I had time just to... Stop there and preach a while, but I'll leave that to the past. Well, let me let me treat something tonight, then something that we don't often talk about called blaspheming the spirit. So Jesus is up there. You know the context of the passage. Jesus is kind of uh, you know casting out devils. Kind of a good thing, and a very very you ready? Religious people are attacking him, saying you're casting out spirits by the spirit of Beelzebub, the king of devils. And Jesus says. Uh, you know, house divided against itself will fall. He said, by the way, you can blaspheme the son, me, that's okay. He said, but if you blaspheme the spirit, you can't be forgiven. Now, what was Jesus saying? He was saying this. You have the witness of me in the Old Testament. You have the witness of me as the perfect man, fulfilling all those prophecies and living a perfect, righteous life. But if you reject the power of the spirit working, if you don't acknowledge this spirit empowerment, by which the new work of God is happening and being ushered in, there's no other options for you. So the question is, is are you looking for something else? Is there going to be another witness, Jesus said? If you miss this boat, you've missed it all. See, that's what it means. Do we need less? No. And I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, so I know you don't believe that. But Acts 1 and 8 isn't just neat preaching. You shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you to be my witnesses. Why? Because without the Holy Ghost, you're not in the new realm and you can't witness about the new realm and you're changed. Why? See, that's where it's at. So the Holy Ghost is the means by which we move into the kingdom of God, that new realm. That's why Jesus, or the Paul said it, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not His. Now, I know that's tough preaching. But I'm going to tell you, that's where we're at. Either we're Pentecostal or it's over. Either, either it's this church or it's nothing. If I didn't believe that, I'd, I'd pack up my stuff. We'd just go eat and we'd have a good time uh, playing cards or doing this stuff. But because what I know about the Spirit of God working in my life, that touch of the Spirit is that witness that this is the right thing. New life. Nothing else.
So what are you talking about, Brother Kim? Well, let me wrap up with uh, talking about essentiality. So oneness separates us, right? But the doctrine of essentiality separates us too. What Jesus said, a man must be born again of water or spirit, of spirit or you can't see or enter the kingdom of God. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, Paul said, By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now what does that mean? It means if you're not baptized in the spirit, you're not in the body. Now how many of you have Pentecostal friends that are not apostolic? Maybe Church of God, Assembly of God, or something like that. It's okay. They be, you know, we love them, and I have great friends. I have friends that are Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, atheists. i got a friend that's a Buddhist. Met him at seminary. It's hysterical who goes to seminary. Eastern Orthodox, all sorts of wild people. I, I met one agnostic. She wanted to be a pastor. I thought that was odd. What are you going to say? I've told brother, forgive me for this, pastor. Uh, you know, instead of blessed assurance, blessed maybe. Jesus, I hope is mine. No, I'm so sorry. Forgive us. You know, there's so many people catching on to this. They know. James Dunn has a great book, a Baptist theologian called Baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he challenges Pentecostals. He says this, you say you love the book of Acts, but you don't love the book of Acts. He said, I'll prove it to you. And he wrote a book in 1973 that no one has ever been able to refute outside of our movement. The only reason it's not been refuted inside our movement is because we agree with it. He says, he says, here's what the problem is. He says, you Pentecostals say you love the book of Acts, but you don't. He said, I'll show you. I'll, I'll prove that's true. He says, first of all, why are you baptizing in the Trinity? Good question. Because when you read the book of Acts, the only baptism you find is baptism in the name of Jesus. He says, look, you say that the, ba and this is what, uh, forgive me tonight for being a little pointed. This is what Assembly of God and Church of God or Church of God prophecy, these are, these are what other Pentecostals will say. You're filled with the Spirit when you accept the Lord as your personal Savior. You're filled with the Spirit. Then you can get this extra thing, this speaking in tongue thing. It's not necessary for salvation, but you can get it. It's kind of like a spare tire. You don't need it, but it's good to have. All right, now what's the problem with that? James Dunn, who, by the way, is not apostolic. He's a Baptist theologian. He says, here's the problem. When you read the book of Acts, this is what salvation looks like. It's a tripartite makeup, he says. Three parts. Repentance, baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus, and some type of charismatic expression, which is probably tongues. He says, so for all of you saying baptism is separate from being filled, that's not true. If you're going to be saved according to the book of Acts, you're baptized into the body. See, that's why we, okay, that's why we start singing songs like the old timers used to do. They were pointed at everything, man. They didn't back up for anybody. You have to remember a lot of them just walked out of the assembly of God and the church of God. And they wrote songs like, are you in the church triumphant? Are you in the Savior's bride? Come be baptized into the body. Because if you ain't baptized, you're not in the body. See, even their songs were pointed. Not because they were mean-spirited, but because this is the only way to get out of the broken age and away from the sin and the debauchery and into the realm of God. That's why we are who we are. are, are just unapologetically. We're going to do what our thing is. All right, so let me give you what I think is the best way to show somebody uh, that the baptism of the Holy Ghost uh, includes tongues. I was at a uh, uh, music fest uh, a couple years ago, and I have a couple of uh, friends, uh, good girls at the school, really good friends with my wife. They still exchange letters, handwritten letters, which is hysterical. Who does that? Just them. I, think, I don't know. If they, does anybody else write letters still? Oh, my Lord. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Well, there they go. Throwbacks. They're dinosaurs. Okay, that's terrible. I'm in hot water. Let me back out of that. All right, so uh, Vanny and Sophie George, they're incredible gals, loud personalities, hysterical. And, uh, but they witness aggressively. And they invited this little girl to uh, the music fest. She loved the concert, loved the music. And I'm, we're downstairs. We have tons of guests in at those things. And like we had about 48 pastors at Pastors Day. We have more than that. The music fest, you know, I'll brag on Brother Anderson a little bit, is the largest music conference in the apostolic 
movement, period. And so uh, we're down there trying to entertain tons of guests, sitting around a table trying to chat people up, be a good host. And I get this text. Ding, and I look at it. It's Sophie. Brother Kilman, are you busy? Yeah, Sophie kind of busy. You know, she said, uh, ding, Brother Kilman, can you come upstairs? And I said, what for? <laughs> College student. And she said, well, we've been witnessing to this girl up here, and she's asking some questions. I said, I'll be right up. I can talk to preachers anytime, and I'm going to go see if I can get a little girl converted. That'd be fun. All right, that's, I'm telling you, that's what we should be about. And so uh, well, let me give you a little advice. I mean, you get to talk to each other all the time, but if you see a visitor walk in here, you can say, guess what? We can talk at Steak and Shake later, but it's so good to have you here. Why? Because you know they need new life. And everything we do is about working people to the, the blessing of that walking in the new kingdom. And so we go upstairs and we start talking. And, and I, I laid this out for her. I said, look, I'm, I'm going to show you something. She said, I, I, I like what I feel, but I, I'm just not sure about this speaking in tongues thing. I said, well, let's go to John chapter 3. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He says, you know, man must be born again. He's like, what does that mean? How can I be, go back into my mom's womb a second time? He's like, no, that which is flesh is flesh. You're thinking carnally. He said, that which is the spirit is spirit. He said, let me give you an analogy. He says, the wind blows where it listens, or where it wills. Now here is the sound thereof. I said, when you look at John chapter 3, the Bible says, the wind, the wind in Greek is the Greek word uh, pneuma. And it can be translated two things. It can be translated wind or spirit. I said, now there's a plain word in the Greek for uh, wind. It's pneumas. If Jesus just meant wind, he could have said that. But he's making an illustration, and immediately everybody's going to get it. He said, nobody argues. That means the Spirit. I said, and the Bible says the wind blows where it listeth, and now here's the sound thereof. I said, now what's the, the, that Greek word uh, there for sound? I said, it's phone. Oh, terrible. I'm too slight to hear. It's phone. Oh, yes, who said it? Say it loud. Phone. Now, what did you say other than that? Did you say phone? Oh, no, phone. Terrible. Forgive me. I thought he was anticipating. I was like, we got a Greek scholar right on the front row. All right? It's, if you transliterate it from the Greek into the English, it, it's, you would spell it P-H-O-N-E, which is what? It's where we get our English word phone. All right? So when you pick up the phone, what do you hear? A sound or a... And that's exactly what the Greek word can mean, sound or voice. So when you say, Jesus is saying, when the Spirit comes, what will you hear? This is what I ask you. He said, Jesus says, the, 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 the wind blows, or listen, we know that's the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes, what are you going to hear? You're going to hear the voice of the Spirit. And she says, yeah, I see that. I said, good. I said, so what is the voice of the Spirit? I said, we could speculate, but let's go to where the Bible handles it for us. When was the Spirit first poured out? She said, Acts chapter 2. I said, that's right. I said, so let's go to Acts chapter 2. We started about verse 2. And it says, there came a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. Now, why this action? Because God didn't want them to miss the point. The Spirit's coming. Remember what I already told you in John 3. I said, in Acts 2, 4 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them up. I said, so what is the voice of the Spirit? She said, tongue. I said, that's right. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you just ask questions and lead people, they'll see it. Then I took her back to John chapter 3, and I said, and Jesus says, you ready? Such is everyone born of the Spirit. I said, how many people will speak with tongues? According to Jesus, everyone. I said, now when this, everyone is born of the Spirit, they're going to hear what when the Spirit comes. She said, the Spirit's voice. I said, that's right. I said, what is the voice of the Spirit again? She said, tongues. I said, that's right. I said, that's why uh, on the day of Pentecost, Peter concludes in Acts 2.39, for the promise is unto you and to your children and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord shall call. I said, how many? She said, everybody the Lord I said, that's right. She said, I have never heard this before. Raised, in all due respect, raised in a church all her life. 
but never heard about the baptism of the Spirit. I'm going to tell you that's a tragedy. I'm, they're, I don't think they're all mean-spirited. They just need you to be kind and tell them there's more. And like, like uh, you know, Priscilla and Aquila did, take Apollos aside and show the word of the Lord more quickly. So I, I talked to her and I said, uh, so uh, what, what do you think about it? She said, well, I see it, but I, I need to go back and talk to my pastor. And I said, you know what? I want you to do that. That would be good. I said, but I, I have to say something. You have to be kind and yet point. I said, if the Apostle Peter couldn't stand in your pulpit and preach the same sermon that he did on the day of Pentecost, it was kind. Anything less than tying people to the Spirit. All you have to do is look at the testimony of the work of the Spirit in the world. Testimony today. There are over 400 million people in China that are Spirit-filled. That's more than the U.S. population. The largest one that one is Pentecostal church in the world is in China. I love Brother Moody. He, he challenges us as a movement. I love my pastor. He's a man who can preach. I wish I was a quarter of the preacher. He would. He had turned around to me every once in a while say on the platform, did I make any sense at all tonight? I want to say respectfully, shut up. I just wanted your introduction. Yeah, all right. But he was preaching at, at General Conference, and he was talking about, he said, the UPC decided we're finally going to train a missionary, and we're going to send him to China. And he knows the missionary from China. They're good friends, so he knew it was not a personal attack. He said, we're finally going to get over there, and we're finally going to reach China, and the UPC's Finally raised enough money. We got enough vision and people united behind the vision. We're making things happen. He said, and then we get off the, off the plane over there and you hit the tarmac and you find the largest oneness Pentecostal church in the world already there. Because the Spirit of the Lord is working. There are over 750 oneness Pentecostal organizations. You are not a small thing. It's the work of God in the earth. And you should never be intimidated. Look, they say Pentecostals were number 580 million right now is what they're saying were numbers. We're growing by 19 million a year. They're saying by 2025 there will be a billion. We'll overtake the Catholics. Most of them are in Africa and Asia and Latin America. That's what God is doing in the world right now. But look in the past. God has always had a people, always had a remnant. I love, we had Cool Aunt Boar at our, our school, and he says uh, in his book uh, he's written called From uh, Gr Jerusalem to Great Britain, he shows where there are three po popes that baptized in Jesus' name. Pope Stephen said to Cyprian of Carthage, he said, look, I know you want me to clamp down on these guys because, you know, I'm not too much in favor of it for it. You know, he's another guy. The other three were, but I'm not. But if I do this, I'll split the Catholic Church. I don't believe history. You have to understand that God's always had a church. He's always had a remnant. He's always had a people doing what he wants them to do. So what are you saying tonight, Brother Kilman? Never be intimidated. This baptism of the Holy Ghost is the means by which we're brought into the kingdom. That's why Jesus said in John 3, 5, and I'm closing. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We are not doing people favors if we try to include them any other way. Brother Mooney was out at a bookstore and he happened to bump into Rob Bell. Anybody ever heard of Rob Bell? He wrote uh, Love Wins. He was interviewed on uh, a few stations and, and made some headlines because he was saying, you know, Erasing Hell was his last book. Nobody's going to hell. I think it's fascinating. The only people I think it's going to, liberal people think are in hell is Hitler. That's the only guy who's going to be very lonely. Origen, one of the developers of the doctrine of the Trinity, actually believed in the eventual salvation of the devil. Hitler's going to be really lonely. No, I'm just kidding. So he bumps into this guy, and Rob Bell, he said, I walked up, he said, I was in casual clothes. I didn't have, you know, a tie on or anything. He said, I thought, oh, that's Rob Bell. I'll get a book and get him to sign it, be neat. He said he walked up, and Rob Bell looked at him, didn't say a word to him of greeting. He just said, are you a Pentecostal preacher? Brother Mooney, you know, said, well, yes, I am a Pentecostal preacher. He said, why are you a Pentecostal preacher? Now, look, you've got to refuse to be intimidated. And Brother Mooney looked back at him and said, why are you not a Pentecostal preacher? 
See, the, okay. See, the question is not why do we baptize in Jesus' name. The question is, why don't you want the name that's above every other name called over you in baptism? The question is not why do you speak in tongues. Why in the world wouldn't you want to be ushered into new life in the kingdom of God? That's the real question today. This is that. I don't think you can be a good Pentecostal preacher without sometimes preaching in your life. This is that. Because if you're looking for something else, you ain't going to find it. But if you're hungry and you want to get out of this broken world, all you got to understand is this is that which was prophesied. This is God's agenda in the world, and it's much larger than us. He just lets us get to share it with people. Now, let's just stand together right now. Could we do this? I want you to raise your hands, and I want you to receive this word today. Folks, we are blessed with.